now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good evening, everybody. This is the mid. I didn't know I raised my hand. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing on this screen. Mike, All right, Ken, you probably go ahead and mute some of our guests. I'm going to. Uh, I forgot to mute her before I right. put the hand. Don't down. worry, Leslie. We'll keep the microphones open if, if a situation comes up as we go here tonight. Well, welcome everybody to the July 2018 roundtable. My name is Mark Robertson. Um, we've been doing this now for eight years, so this is something of a birthday party or anniversary party. I'm joined here tonight by my dear friend Ken Kabula, and. Uh, on one of our special guest nights, Herb Lemkul. Um, both Cy and Hugh are unable to join us tonight, so it's going to be the three of us. But uh, we didn't have a cake, so we thought we would take and, and uh, celebrate with the Justice League photo here on the, on the cover page. Ken said no costumes eight years ago. I don't listen very well. He knows that. He doesn't listen to me very well either when I want to go to places like Punxsutawney. Um, but uh, we could have put the heads on just about any one of the bodies here, and we would all work out. Uh, I did choose mine for the the sleek uh, speed and the, the freedom label there. We've got uh, Cy Lynch is there as Wisdom. He's got the nice red cross there. Uh, Hugh McManus. Power. He's been one of our leading contributors over the years. I gave Ken the duty slot, and uh, I, li I like that picture of him from the. Is that from the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, Ken? It's one of those. That's two. from the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, it's from the Wall Street Journal article. The next one was the only. We had to put the damsel in one spot among the seven, and you guys can figure out the rest of that one. That's that's Kim Butcher of Evansville, Indiana, in the truth slot as Wonder Woman. Um, Shrek there is Nick Stratagos from Pittsburgh in the Batman or Justice slot. And uh, also joining us here tonight is one of our favorite guest uh, nights and just a wonderful educator and volunteer here in Michigan, Herb Lemkul. Special welcome to you, Herb. Thank you. So uh, there's a few people that are not with us here tonight that we should mention. Again, we've already mentioned Cy and... Uh, and Hugh are unable to join us, but we've had contributions from people like Susan Michalik from Wisconsin, Ann Manning from Houston. Again, Matt Spielman, who is now uh, relocated to, I believe it's Dublin, Ireland. Dublin, Ireland. Yes, he is. Uh huh. Probably part of the, the, the new part of the company over there for Delphi. And, uh, and again, we just want to basically give a nod to our audiences. Our audiences have been, have been a part of this. We keep the microphones pretty open. We stick around for a Q&A afterwards. Um, but this program really is intended to be just uh, a moment of sharing, kind of exploring of ideas. And uh, we have, we've had a lot of fun over the last eight years. Any words from either you or, or Herb, Ken? I'm just, uh, I never thought that we'd still be doing this eight years uh, after we started it, Mark. Uh, it's almost as much fun today as it was when we first put it together. Uh, and I think we've come up with some great ideas. And more importantly, I think we've demonstrated that uh, a bunch of, of well-meaning amateurs that pay attention and do their homework uh, can can match the market and in a lot of cases actually beat the market. Uh, why don't you move into our uh, uh, results page here to show folks how we've been doing for the last 10 years. Okay, we will do that. First, we've got to do some uh, legal, beagle, legal beagle paperwork. Again, just stopping for a second to remind everybody that, as always, no investment recommendation whatsoever is intended. We do this, as Ken just said for demonstration. We're demonstrating a way, a method, an approach to discovering the best companies, better companies at better prices. It's really that simple. And uh, the companies that we air out and explore here, it's all part of demonstrating a process and a philosophy made popular by the modern investment club movement. And uh, that, that's the, the approach that we, uh, we follow. Um, Again, do your own homework. This is a demonstration. Um, if you do want an email reminder, if you have somebody that you want added to the reminder list, nkavula1 at comcast.net down at the bottom of the page. 
if you have uh, follow-up questions or want copies of slides, that's my email address, markr at manifestinvesting.com, and drop me a note. Here's our standing agenda. Um, it's been the same for eight years now, 96 meetings, 96 months. Um, again, welcome, especially if you're here joining us for the first time. A special welcome to you and uh, welcome to everybody. We will take a look at uh, performance. We have had very strong performance. We want to continue to understand what we're doing and continue to explore the things that have been working and we're always searching for improvement. We're going to look at some quick challenges to the portfolio. By challenges, we mean stocks that it should be considered as potential selling candidates to close out the positions. We've got four presentations, a quick look at Cognizant Technology because Cy Lynch, even in absentia, is submitting Cognizant for the for consideration. Herb's going to cover Ionis uh, Pharmaceuticals, Ken, Coherent, and I'm going to cover Skechers because it's all about the shoes. And uh, we'll do an audience poll, and then again, we'll leave it open for Q&A at the end. We try to wrap this up in about uh, 75 minutes, but uh, we tend to stick around and answer questions. Ken, do you want to describe what it is we're doing here? What we do yeah, when we started yeah when we started 10 years ago uh, we wanted to put together a tracking portfolio uh, a list of ideas that people could consult uh, we wanted to keep that list current so as long as the idea was fairly decent we thought it should stay on the tracking list and when the idea got to a place where it wasn't returning the kinds of returns we thought it should return, or when the fundamentals were falling apart or the quality was falling apart, we wanted to drop it from that list. Uh, we do it by each one of the knights presenting their single favorite investment opportunity. Uh, we're following the words of George Nicholson, who said 20 to 25 percent of your portfolio could be in non-core holdings, non-traditional kinds of investment. That means occasionally we're looking at companies with no earnings. We're looking at, at emergent companies. Occasionally uh, we're looking at things that, that a, a standard Better Investing Investment Club uh, would kind of giggle at if they brought it in front of the club. Uh, our goal is to have a long-term return that beats the market over time by at least five percentage points. We think if George Nicholson were alive today, that would be the goal that he would set. That was the goal that he set for investment clubs way back in the 40s when he said investment clubs should do 15% on an annualized basis. That's beating the market, beating the average market by five points. With modern tools, especially with computers and with the availability of information, we think that that goal, if Nicholson had survived until today, we think that goal would have been modified to beat the market on any given year by at least five points versus a broad index. It doesn't have to be the Wilshire 5000. It could be the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index. It could even be the S&P 500 Index although that's a little bit more narrow. We've noticed that all of those types of indexes tend to track reasonably close together over long periods of time. We're also interested in accuracy of 60 to 70 percent. We'd like 60 percent or more of our choices to pass this benchmark of beating the market by five points. So the next slide is going to show you how we've done over 10 years. Go on, Mark. Ta-da. Actually, I'm throwing you a curveball tonight. First of all, I want to know, can I bring Bitcoin as a non-core investment sometime? What? We'll boo you off the stage, okay? okay. All right, eight <laughs> years. Just want to make the point that we've been doing this for a while. 441 buys, 215. So that's a lot of decisions. But the return that has been achieved by the tracking portfolio this is fully accounting for dividends and splits it is 18.2 percent we've had a lot of fun over the years people recognize some of those images some of the people involved susan michalik is there on the far right along with kim as our guest damsels we've had a lot of fun with the olympics uh, our performance has crept up above the line we have uh, the stanley cup on our page um, a lot of good fun going on there and then many people will remember 
uh, Hugh McManus's timeless presentation about investing like Spock, not like Kirk. And uh, that was a good one. Some good, clean fun. I thought we'd just take a moment before we break into the performance to take a look at what the best performing selections have been year by year um, and where they came from. Show you a little bit about the math behind the numbers that you see. And these are still active or open positions. These are actively or presently in the tracking portfolio. So you can see, uh, I believe that's group payments up at the top from Cy back in October the year 2010, which was just a couple months after we got started. That's a one time. Global Payments Network, Mark. Global uh, Payments I'm, I'm Network. Sorry. Yeah, Global Payments Network. So you can see that $1,000 has become $5,813. All right, and that's actually beating the market by 11.6% per year. It's a 25.5% annualized total return. And uh, so we have some fun. Uh, the thing that really gets me is uh, as you look down that list, you can see some fairly interesting ideas. Many of them are one-time selections. Uh, NetEase down there at the number three position. Uh, I had forgotten that Kim brought S&P Global back in February of 2013. That's knocking it out. Hugh McManus's uh, controversial pick of Amazon at the National Convention that year. It's the, actually the best all-time selection on the chart for the active companies. But uh, you can see that the audience has been involved in uh, three of those annual leaders on the list. There is- well, It looks like, yeah, it looks like one of our annual leaders got knocked off today, Mark. Uh, the IPGP, uh, which means it's still doing extremely well from where we bought it. Uh, look at the average cost. We bought it at 82.37. Uh, it's still trading uh, above 140. I didn't look at the exact price that it closed uh, finally at the end of the day. So it still has a great return attached to it, but it's no longer that 40% relative return. In fact, I think you you looked uh, it, into the spreadsheet to find out what would supplant this if we did the prices at the close of the trading today. And I think one of your choices, Mercado Libre, M-E-L-I, would have been the best pick from 2016 if in fact we would have uh, done this list as of today yeah. rather than as of last night. And I appreciate that, Ken. I just didn't want to appear that uh, desperate to, to well, get my that's name. That's why on. I said it for you, Mark, okay? <laughs> so, you know, a lot of these, we, we've had a lot of fun with Fleet Corps at the bottom. The audience seconded that one. And then, of course, Nick Stratagos' presentation of Five Below. Um, that's so far as the current leader for this year. And... Uh, here actually, I'm, I'm getting Mark. I'm getting a, a note from our resident researcher Len Douglas in the Southeastern Michigan chapter, and Len says IPGP closed at 164 today. So if I look at that 82, uh, it's still a double since 2016. You can't you can't ask for a lot more than that. Uh, uh, when everything's doing what it has to be doing. Yeah, so. that's what I thought I saw too. So some good stuff. And again, I, I just, I get a kick out of the fact that the, the success comes from everywhere. And that's that's a reminder to investment clubs across the country that uh, don't discount the ideas of your partners. Uh, accept them and explore them completely. Here's a list of the the leaders with the closed. These would be positions that we closed, basically sold over the last uh, eight years. And uh, fortunately, I show up on these quite a bit. Um, TJX was a great one from year one. Back in 2010, we had good a good time with Southwest Airlines, Home Away. I had forgotten about Cyberonics, Ken. That was a pretty good run that you and the audience had there in 2015. Um, but some really fun ones there, including the all-time leader, which happens to be mine with Stifle Financial, that's SF. They're in the middle. So, again, the audience is getting involved here. Multiple people bringing these type of things home. Good, clean fun. And uh, I, I will, I will remark, Mark, that uh, we've we've always counseled people to hold core holdings until their potential uh, annualized return comes down into money markets. And the only sale that I regret making over all 10 years was that sale of TJX. I still think it's a wonderful company to own today. 
And I think we sold it a little bit too early. We should have let it run, even though we sold it and locked in a 37% relative return. I would have liked to have seen a 30% plus relative return for 10 years. Uh, and I think it would have come close to doing that for us if we would have held on to it. The only sale that I regret, it was one of our very first sales, and we did a lot of discussion about what did the sale mean and when should we get rid of it. Yeah, I can remember back in that time frame talking ourselves out of Costco, selling Costco, and that is still in the portfolio. Yeah, you know, from yep. that time frame. Yeah, good stuff. All right, let's keep pressing on. Here is the overall over time. And again, we celebrated uh, within the last year, actually crossing that 5% uh, advantage to the market threshold that Ken was talking about a minute ago. So again, achieving a return of 18.2% while the market's going up 127 as measured by the Wilshire 5000, we have beaten the market by five and a half percentage points. That's 550 basis points if that if you speak that language, with about half of the selections beating the market over uh, over time. We'd like to see that be a little bit beefier, but the one that really matters is that 18.2% uh, over time. So we like the momentum, we like the trend. Let's uh, hope we stay in the in the promised land there. All right, switching gears to uh, what are the companies that have actually delivered that performance in terms of the active holdings. You can actually look at, I believe there's about approximately 90 active positions in the tracking portfolio. You can look at them at this uh, public link uh, listed at the top of the page. The next line down is the legend, which basically tells you how many times everything is selected. Um, in the case of Cognizant Technology, it's been selected 14 times as is shown in the legend. So what we do is anytime it's selected by any participant, any knight, any damsel, or the audience, we invest $1,000 in it. So the 14 time selections in the Cognizant means that $14,000 has been, has been put in, and it's now worth $27,000. So you can do that with any company on this list or by referring to the, the longer list at the public link. So um, we've had a pretty good run with many of these companies. Look at Amazon. Amazon's a two-time selection, and it's it's gone up uh, nearly $10,000. There's a number of companies on here that have uh, been quite rewarding and uh, a lot of fun. Look at S&P Global and PayPal down at the bottom there for Kim. Those are selected just a couple of times. All right, let's go ahead and keep pressing on. I thought we would just make the point, especially since I wants to bring Cognizant here tonight. Uh, in, the, in his absence, we'll be presenting by proxy. But uh, this is a look at Cognizant technology from the first time it was added back in the first year of the, of the roundtable. And you can see the price chart there. And those are the actual 14 transactions that have taken place over time. So when you hear us teasing Cy about his selections of Cognizant, there they are in black and white. Uh, you can see that he owns 12 of them and uh, actually has done pretty well. Don't let the red ink fool you. That means that most of those positions are basically keeping up with the market. This, All of those positions add up to an overall position, which is beating the market by a few percentage points. But the one that I find uh, quite interesting is after the sixth nomination by Cy, all of you guys in the audience decided to second that one. That was the best time you could have selected to, sec to second the motion back in June 2013 when we we're in the green circle here. That's the actual best performing lot, if you want to think of it as a lot. The $1,000 invested on that night, June 25th, 2013, is actually the top performing piece of this puzzle. And uh, I came back a couple months later and in, in the jumped on the bandwagon, the coattails, but you can see size gone back another six times since then. So I, I think that's kind of fun to notice that the audience uh, finally chimed in after on the sixth, sixth one was a charm. All right. One of the things that we do like to do every month is follow the, the better investing uh, practice of challenging the weakest return in the portfolio, the weaker returns in the portfolio, and see if we want to continue to keep these companies in the tracking portfolio. And at the top of the list tonight are Cambrex, Robert Half, and First Financial Bank shares. And uh, these have all been actually pretty good positions, most of them uh, gaining pretty handsomely. 
but with the price run up you get a little bit of a a, a dwindling of the return forecast you can see we're in lower single digits approaching zero certainly less than the median par which tonight is 7.1 percent so we basically want to challenge those now ken those first two are yours successful selections and uh, first financial is actually size um so we'll just do a quick audit of the three and see if we want to let go of any of the three so here's well a mark in the in the last uh six months i've owned all three of those I have sold one of those three uh, because not not because it's not a good stock anymore, but because of valuation. In fact, it's the one that we're looking at right now. I have uh, sold my position in Cambrix uh, because uh, it had made uh, a lot of money and the potential going forward uh, didn't look very attractive uh, for my portfolio. I did not consider Cambrix a core holding. I still don't consider Cambrix a core holding, but I do consider it a high quality company. Yeah, and it really does come down to, do, do you think that they're going to have high single digit growth or something a little bit less than that? And then, you know, a little bit of weakness here would drive that return down to low single digits. Uh, I wouldn't run for the hills if it would if I was holding it myself yet, but I would be pretty pretty close to having a a finger on the trigger. Um, I I, I go ahead. Uh, I'm no finish your thought, then I'll uh, I'll make my thought. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. We're, we're probably heading the same place. The one thing that bothers me greatly is the plateauing of profitability, and that blue line is is flattening. Yeah. I saw I would, in order to continue to hold it, I think I would want to see some expectation of of improving fundamentals. Yeah, my uh, uh, my issue with Cambrix Mark is I bought it as a very small company in my portfolio, and I expect my small companies to do some fairly heavy lifting. So when uh, when it busted through the 12% annualized uh, return. Uh, and and move down uh, below that and then when the sales growth started to slow as well i uh, noticed that the sales growth forecasts for 2018 are under nine percent uh, that's a great sales forecast for a medium-sized company but 811 million dollars in sales 812 million dollars in sales uh, I'm that's just a little bit light uh, for me as far as holding it as a small company and that was one of the big factors that pushed me to uh, to leave to let let this go from my portfolio and again I want to make the point I had made a significant amount of uh, of return from this particular small stock okay the second one is Robert Half, and that's also been extremely good to the roundtable tracking portfolio. Pretty good picture. Uh, it really comes down to a, a crux question that I would toss at you, Ken. When you look at value line, they have a, an average PE expectation of about 20. You can see the PE graph on the lower right. That certainly doesn't seem to be unusual, but if you look at the consensus, the consensus including Morningstar, S&P, and some others, there's a little bit more modest expectation when it comes to the the future PE. What would your perspective on this one be? Well, I'm still holding Robert Half. Uh, I like the industry that it's in. Uh, again, the, the sales are a little bit low for what I normally look for in a medium-sized company uh, at $7.4 billion, sales of 6% are more like a really big company uh, but this company fills a space uh, in my portfolio that I, I don't have anything else even remotely similar to to Robert Half. Uh, my uh, uh, study on Robert Half deals with a PE that's at 18 marks, so uh, that's pretty much in line with the uh, the 20 and with the 17 that you chose. So uh, I'm I, I'm relatively content. Uh, with the stock, it's making me decent money, not outstanding money, uh, but uh, I'm still holding Robert Half. Uh, Mark and Ken, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it would be helpful if you told everybody what they do. You know, Robert Half, I think, is an accounting company, and they're having trouble trying to recruit people. I think. Oh, well, uh, not ex well. <laughs> 
Yes and no, as far as an accounting company is concerned. Actually, Robert Half is a staffing company, and they yeah. supply they supply staff. substitute they supply substitutes to various types of jobs, and they do supply accountants. And you're right; one of their biggest challenges right now are finding enough qualified people to fill the staffing needs of their clients. Uh, we're facing a, a fairly decent labor shortage in a lot of specialized fields, and Robert Half places people that have specialized skills, so that's uh, weighing on on what their whole business model is based on. You're right. It's gotta Thank be, you. It's got to be pretty competitive, too. I'm, I'm sure Herb has used some of these type of companies in the past. All right. And last but not least, this is size first financial. Again, a very strong performing company over the time. It's hard to beat up straight and parallel any more than this one. Um, and again, it's not a screaming sell, but it's among our weakest. Um, I think I would be inclined just to hang in there. I I would not uh, sell first financial. It It sits in three or four of the portfolios that I'm involved with. And it's one of the highest quality banks uh, that we've been able to locate. Uh, and we've done a lot of work on banks in my two model clubs and in my own personal club. Uh, a lot of work to identify the highest uh, quality banks and put some money into them. We, we really still feel that this whole idea that banks are very undervalued uh, is valid, and we're still looking for rising interest rates and rising yields on on bonds to to make the bank's business model work in a very profitable way. Yeah, this this one's pretty solid. So I mean, our weakest companies in the portfolio. This is probably a testament to the the spring cleaning we've done over the last year or so. Because the, there's not much really wrong with the three of these. I do think if any of them approached a return forecast of zero, I might be tempted to do something, but I, I don't see it now. Yeah, I wouldn't have any problems uh, uh, moving Cambrix out, but at the same time, I have no problems keeping Cambrix in this portfolio either. I think Cambrix was the number one company in our small companies list from last October, wasn't it, Mark? That is correct, and I mean, it slowed down a bit. That's an obstacle to it going forward in this year's list, but again, that's. Uh, I, I think we just raised the the vigilance on this one and keep pressing on. Sounds good to me. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and bust into the stocks. I'll just make a quick one on Cognizant. You guys already saw that we've purchased it 14 times already. Cy wants to nominate it again because it is up straight in parallel. It's in a whole bunch. I think the vast majority of investment club portfolios have this company, so it's no stranger. They provide, again, not the same type of services as Robert Half, but similar type business model. They do a lot of management consulting and that sort of stuff and IT type consulting worldwide. Uh, a lot of business in India and the United States. Here's a look at the company from uh, an analysis perspective. Again, you're talking about a $15 billion company growing at 10%, uh, churning in these very consistent margins in the 16, 17% range. Uh, generating a consistent PE of 16, 17, 18. Uh, nothing wrong with this company. Up straight in parallel. A uh, little bit of a price dip here lately, but Cy wants to throw another log on the fire. It'll make it a 15 time selection. And uh, his point is the quality is hanging in there, even though they had a bit of a challenge with the global recession. But uh, uh, the price has crept up finally. We were patient. We waited through the plateau. The Even though that graph looks like the return forecast has been sagging off and, and declining, it's not uh, a terrible decline, and we're still looking at double-digit returns, and uh, their business improves every day that the global economy improves. So he would like to go ahead and continue accumulation of cognizant technology. Any questions or comments, Ken? Well, I'd like to put a plug in. Uh, if you're sitting in our audience and you belong to a model club, uh, Ann Cunez and myself are in process right now of collecting data from as many of the model clubs as want to participate throughout the country. 
uh, we put a survey out there that you can have your club fill out and we'll be doing a complete dive into what the model clubs hold and what their portfolios look like in the September stock up program uh, through Better Investing. Um, if your model club uh, has not yet filled out the Survey Monkey survey, the latest uh, chapter advance has a link to that survey uh, and you need to get one person there. It'll take about oh a grand total of about seven minutes to fill that survey out. Maybe not even that much if you have a uh, a statement right in front of you of what what the club owns and we'd love to have your club included in this study when we present it in September. Last time we presented this information we found that every single model club that participated in the study, except for one, owned Cognizant technology. Wow. All right. Well, it's among the most widely followed companies that manifest investing, too, so we can certainly understand that. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and welcome our guest night back, Herb, from God's country up there in Traverse City. Are you actually home now and enjoying this wonderful summer, Herb? I am. We've had a great summer this summer. I tell you, we've been doing, I spend, you know, two or three times a week playing pickleball. I sail on Wednesday nights. Uh, we've been doing a lot of traveling. I had a granddaughter get married in Wisconsin. So, you know, we're just very, very blessed in what we were able to, to do. Pretty but cool. I also want to say congratulations for Mark and Ken on being, this is our 10th anniversary. And you guys have been just an icons of information, ideas, and things that we can look at and learn from. And it's been very, very rewarding for me, our clubs, and for a lot of people throughout the country. Well, thanks, Herb. It's eight, eight years, by the way. Eight years. Eight, eight years. years. Okay. Thank you, Herb. Well, thank you. Herb. Thank if, you. We make, if we make that. it to 10, we'll blow up. We'll have a big blow up somewhere. <laughs> okay, good. So right. anyway, I, I really struggled that you called and wanted me to be able to present a, a, a stock. And I really struggled with this one because it's one of those that uh, our investment club, Cherry Capital Investment Club, has owned for quite some time. We found it by because one of our members is has a friend of a friend of a friend who works for Ionis. And so he said, we should study it. And we bought it. In our original purchase, we made some pretty good money on it. And uh, But then I'm going to talk to you about some of the reasons why you should or shouldn't buy a stock. One of those reasons why we own this stock is because I had a great granddaughter who was born with spinal muscular atrophy, that's SMA, and Ion's Pharmaceutical is one of their drugs that they have come to bring to fruition is a drug that attacks and be able to help those that have this particular disease. She died when she was eight years old. She was just a, a bubble. She was just a, a wonderful person and uh, was loved by everybody around her. Today, if she if they had had this drug, she probably would still be alive if she was given this drug when she was born. So they also are finding there are fewer and fewer people in the United States are coming down with this spinal muscular atrophy. So we own the stock because because of that, and then also one of our newest members of our Cherry Capital Investment Club joined our club here about a year and a half ago. His daughter graduated from college and started looking around for companies to go to work for. And lo and behold, where do you think she lands? Ionis Pharmaceuticals in California. Hmm. So it was one of those things that, you know, if you know something about the company and you're comfortable with where they're going and what they're doing, uh, it's something you might want to look at. This company does not make a profit. It hasn't made any profit. Its projections in the future is going to be that they should be able to have a lot of companies that are going to come on online to be able to make this thing work for everybody. So IONS is just one of those companies that uh, uh, you got to be able to know that it does a lot of good things. Its, it's management is really, really good. Uh, they really do an outstanding job. Uh, they, the leading company in RNA targeted drug discovery, uh, development focused on developing drugs for patients who have the highest unmet medical needs, those pay severe and rare diseases. So it's really, they look at small clubs, they sm or small uh, diseases, and then they try and find a way to be able to do it. They also are um, uh, in 
bed with Biogen and commercializing Spinoza, uh, their anti-sense drugs that IONS discovered and they're advancing in phase three studies. It's, improved, it's been approved by the, economic, or by the European Union uh, for stage one and two. And I think we heard a great presentation last month about drugs and how they go through the different stages. And I thought that was very, very nice, very well done. So I think it's really important to know that. I own Pharmaceutical, if you go to their website, they have a couple of videos that talks about how they take the people with SMA take them out on a surfboard and show them how to surf in the water. And it's the members of their staff that are doing that. So you, you just wanna know, you know, when you start looking at this particular company, it, in our portfolio, we call it our high risk company. And every time, if you talk to, look at your value line, they will also talk about that it's a high risk, but it also I think has some very high potential uh, if any of these drugs start to come on board, I think in, the, in 2019, they're going to start showing a profit for the first time ever. And they're projected to go up to $3.20 a share for profit in the next five years. So this is a company that's very risky. We know that it's risky in our portfolio. We've had some discussion within our, our um, uh, club at, about whether or not we should sell it and how we should handle it where we should go with it and whether or not we should wait and just hold on to it. Our club is known for holding on to stocks and, and probably longer than we should, but yet it seems to prove beneficial. So, you know, IONS is just a great little company and I would recommend, you know, this, when I start looking at the uh, value line, um, you know, when you start looking at projections, they're looking at a 70% per, uh, Price in uh, price at the low, which is a 50% gain or 11% return. Uh, their high price are going up to $115, 150% return, so or 26 total, 26% 26 total return. So their earnings per share are, are projected to go up even with value line. Uh, they the book value uh, is projected to go up. Uh, capital spending has been pretty. Um, stagnant at 15 cents a share. So I see their revenues almost doubling from uh, 18 or more than double. So I think this is a company that could be very, very uh, exciting, also nerve wracking, and also one of the reasons why you may or may not want to own this company, but I sure would recommend do your own homework. This is a company, like I say, is, is highly risky. Okay, thanks, Herb. Yeah, I think you have to look at this kind of like a young Amgen. I can remember back in the early 1990s, we had a company uh, called Aguron Pharmaceuticals. They were de dealing with cancer cures or drugs, and, and they were eventually bought out about eight years after we bought it uh, by Johnson & Johnson and some Japanese company. So that type of thing can happen. So you have to look, kind of regard it as a potential Amgen, but in the early days. And like Herb said, if this thing takes off, it could be uh, extremely rewarding. If it doesn't, um, much less so. But uh, it's the type of thing that can, can be fun. It'll be interesting to see what uh, what um, Mr. McManus will have to say about it in the future, because we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll bring it up again. Well, it, you know, when you look at the dashboard, um, it's got a par of 19.8% on your particular dashboard and, and manifest. Uh, mm -hmm. But your financial strength is weak and earning stability is not there. The quality is not there. So it's a really quite a risky particular company. But their growth could give you uh, some great uh, uh, that, that growth at 24%. So this is a really small company. And uh, so it doesn't belong in everybody's portfolio. But it could be in anybody's if they, if they want to look at this as a highly risk company that could the, the bigger the risk, the higher the gain the opportunity yep when it works out it could be um, pretty spectacular all right thanks herb yep all right ken you can take us away with uh, coherent okay let's let's start before we go to the first slide let's start with how i found coherent 
Uh, I'm a big fan of three different screeners. Uh, my primary screener is from Manifest Investing, and I use that one on a on a practically weekly basis, sometimes twice a week basis, to try to identify companies that I might be interested in buying or or selling. Uh, but I also like the screeners that are available uh, through the SSG Plus. Uh, that's the online tool. Uh, the uh, Plus is the uh, the more robust version of the online tool and it has a screener with some preset screens and I really like their preset screen for small companies and for value companies. So I, I use those uh, on a fairly regular basis and then the third screener that I really use a lot is the value line screener. Uh, it has uh, dozens and dozens of criteria that I can put onto it uh, and I can really kind of pinpoint exactly the kind of uh, stock that I'm looking for when I'm using the value line screener. Well, I spent about an hour and a half the, uh, today in the morning uh, looking for stocks uh, to present to the round table and uh, one name kept appearing, coherent, uh, it appearing on all of my screens. It appeared on the value screen and the small company screen and the high quality screen uh, in the preset uh, screens from the SSG Plus. It uh, appeared in the, the top 1% uh, of the manifest rank stocks. Uh, I looked at it very carefully and then I did some screening in value line and lo and behold, it appeared in that list as well. So uh, I was very interested and I started looking at their website and reading a little bit about it. And here's what came up. Let's go to that first slide, Mark. Uh, Coherent is the leader in photonics. And photonics uh, is a fancy word for light. Uh, they use light in a lot of different ways, mostly as lasers, and they do all kinds of things with these lasers. Let's go to the next slide, Mark. Uh, if you look, uh, this company does most of its sales outside of North America. Uh, this is not a typical American company. 63%, almost two-thirds of its sales are to Asian countries. Uh, a big chunk of that uh, in China, obviously. 16% uh, in the U.S., 18% in Europe, and 3% in the rest of the world. So this is not a typical American company. Uh, Coherent operates in four main businesses. They operate in microelectronics. And when you think of this, think of making chips. Uh, lasers are very... Uh, uh, widely used in creating chips in various different kinds of companies. Uh, they're used especially in creating these organic light emitting diodes, these OLED chips as you uh, have come, they've come to be known. Uh, we've talked about that before with companies like Universal Display, which actually does the creating of the chips and they're using tools from uh, companies like Coherent to make these chips. They happen to be, that happens to be a very fast growing business. Uh, and the growth for Coherent versus the market is, is spectacular. And they hold the first position among all their competitors uh, in that particular segment of the business. The next uh, segment of their business is material processing. Uh, and they're doing things that that uh, kind of Star Wars kind of things with lasers, using lasers lasers to engrave, to cut, to weld, uh, and that's what we've come to think of lasers at. We we don't have a, a wide ranging idea of lasers. We think of them zapping things. And again, a very strong growth uh, versus the market for this business for coherent. Uh, they're either second or third, depending on the uh, business we're talking about, the sub-business that we're talking about. And notice there under competitors, you see IPGP. We've talked about uh, IPG Photonics uh, this evening before the meeting started. They took a really big hit today in the stock market. And Coherent also went down uh, significantly today. Uh, I happen to think it's in sympathy. A lot of times companies that do the same kind of thing as a company in trouble 
people tend to move in the same direction when there's a big hit on one company. I think Coherent uh, had those issues with its price today uh, because of the problems that IPG reported. Uh, I'm making the point, I guess, that Coherent competes with IBG, but just in one of its four businesses. It doesn't compete throughout the entire business range. And this materials processing is not a quarter of the business for Coherent. Uh, you look at the third uh, business they compete in, that's uh, original equipment manufacturing components and instruments. Uh, medical things, defense things, display instruments, uh, diagnostic instruments. Uh, their growth is not as high versus the market here, but they do hold the number one position uh, versus all of their competitors. And look at the opportunities. We're talking about laser eye care, dental care. Uh, my dentist uh, is predicting that you will see lasers in dentist's office in the normal family dentist office uh, within the next five to 10 years. Uh, I'm the leading edge of the baby boom. I was born in 1946 and that's the oldest baby boomer there is. And I just had cataract surgery. Uh, laser eye care was not part of my cataract surgery. It's not, mine was not done with a laser, but uh, the prediction is that as that surgery is done more and more and more often, the tools will improve and it will move to some laser surgery. You've already heard of things like Lasix and things like that, which already do use uh, uh, lasers to do the surgery. So uh, this is a big business for uh, Coherent. And then the last business is a relatively small and it's a relatively stable business for Coherent. Uh, they're number one in the marketplace in this business as well. And this is uh, dealing with uh, research materials, uh, government program materials, things that that are used to uh, to help find out various things in science. Uh, it's called uh, uh, ado second physics under growth uh, opportunities, but it's basically materials that are used in laboratories uh, as they try to come up with answers for all kinds of different physical science questions. So the company has a real broad base, does an awful lot of things. Its biz biggest business is the microelectronics and the two in the middle are smaller portions of their total business. And the scientific research is a very, very small part uh, of their business. Next slide, Mark. Uh, again, the growth drivers that I've talked about, uh, one of the biggest ones that I didn't talk about are these smaller geometries in silicone. What that basically means is that the chips are getting smaller and smaller and they need better and better ways of creating these chips. And that means they're moving to lasers. They're using lasers to create these geometries. Uh, this metal cutting, welding, and joining applications are being attached to robots in factory situations. If you were to walk across the floor of an auto plant uh, in the 70s, you would have seen it bustling with all kinds of workers. You walk across that same floor today and there are still workers there, but now they're controlling robots and the robots are doing all kinds of jobs uh, that, uh, call for very sophisticated joining techniques or cutting techniques. And the laser is a tool that's being used uh, uh, for a lot. Uh, this OEM instrumentation, uh, I like that last one. That last one comes from a company that uh, Coherent purchased. It was called Rofen Sonar. And if you've been with me for a long time listening to my uh, talks about different stocks that I like, Rofen Sonar was a local company here in mid-Michigan, and they did a lot of work with lasers with the automobile industry, but also a lot of work with cosmetic lasers, uh, dealing with uh, lasers to take away 
brown spots on your hands or, or different parts of your body, dealing with veins uh, on the tops of your hands to make them look younger, uh, all kinds of aesthetic and dermatology lasers. And that company was purchased by Coherent a couple, three years ago. Uh, and folded right into what they're doing. So the uh, my my original idea of Rofen Sinair is still alive. It's just a piece of coherent. Now, next slide, Mark. I went to the value line, and lo and behold, this was a triple play. Uh, I'm looking at the price projections out for the next three to five years. The first leg of the triple play is is a uh, stock price that is under a little bit of pressure, and I translate that to the value line sheet as total returns that are double digit at the low end, and then if they're double digit at the low end, of course, they'll be double digit at the high end as well. So when I see 11 to 23% annualized returns for the next three to five years, that indicates to me a depressed stock price. I'm then looking at the PE ratio at the top of the sheet and comparing it to the average annualized PE ratio, uh, and I've drawn an arrow down to it and circled it down there so you can see it. I'm looking for a PE expansion going on, and uh, 14 to about 19, that's certainly expansion happening. And what I like is that it's not expansion happening at nosebleed levels. Uh, these are both under 20. That's really nice. Uh, the current price uh, is down around 160, 158, something like that. And so these PE ratios are probably fairly accurate, the one at the top of the page. The last thing I'm looking for are profit margins to increase over where they were. The actual profit margin percentage in 2017 net profit margin was 12.1%. Uh, the, the projected for 2018 is 14.8%, but look three to five years out, they're projecting profit margins of 17%. So I have a triple play. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean this is a buy. It just means it's a really good idea that probably should move up to the top of your let's study it list. So I moved coherent up to the top of the let's study it list, and here's what I found out. Uh, next slide, Mark. Well, the lines are fairly decent. I'm, I took out uh, some of the earlier data there to, to get a better read uh, on the growth, especially the growth from 14 through 16. And then I noticed that the growth 16 to 17 was even higher. So I'm reading off of my graph here that the uh, sales growth uh, is running about 12% uh, over the period of time. The earnings uh, running about 22% and pre-tax profit about 24%. I added the net income line to this graph. Uh, that's the uh, profit after they've paid taxes because I'm looking to see if there's uh, any change between the distance on the pink line and the orange line. Uh, I know that this is really a, a balance sheet uh, when I'm reading it. Starts out with sales, ends up with earnings per share, and the distance between pink and orange is telling me taxes, relative taxes being paid. If that distance increases, then the taxes are going up, if that distance decreases, then the taxes are going down. I'm noticing that Coherent does not do a fiscal year that matches the calendar. Uh, the last quarter, which is the second quarter for their fiscal year, ended, uh, and I've circled it up there, it ended on uh, 318. Am I reading that correctly? I think I am, 318. Yes. And uh, I'm looking at the quarter. That means that the dot before it, the, the open dot after the 2017 dot on earnings, that's the dot where if in fact they're going to take a charge for repatriation, that's where it will appear. Unfortunately, I don't get those dots for these lines that I add in this tool. So I went to their annual report. They are taking a little bit of a charge, 
Um, I'm not too worried about how large that charge is because I'm looking at the trend for these last two quarters and they seem to be fairly consistent with the trend that was in place from 2014 to 2016. So I'm continuing to uh, project from the most recent quarter there. I'm looking at a debt, looks to be manageable. Uh, they have made some uh, uh, purchases in the last year, so their debt is up a little bit, but they've indicated that was due to uh, some acquisitions. I'm looking at a return on equity that's fairly decent. 15 is a good number, so this almost 20 in the most recent year is a very good number. And I'm looking at pre-tax profit on sales, which seems to be moving in an upward direction. That's a wonderful thing to see. Next slide, Mark. I went to manifest. I looked at the uh, graph that's at the very bottom uh, of the manifest page for coherent. And I love to see this rising quality line. The focus just on the blue line, if you will. You see that quality hit a low back in 2016, and it's been rising very consistently uh, uh, month after month, year after year. It's been moving up. So that's a, that's a great thing. It's now into the top quintile. It's above 80, and that's an excellent thing. Uh, I'm looking at where the par was at the end of the last complete month. And so this data is one month old because today is the last day of July. Uh, another piece of data will move into this graph uh, tomorrow or the next day. So the par was down around 8% uh, at the end of July. So I'm keeping that in mind. I want to see what the par maybe is going to be when I when I move on to my study. So next slide, please, Mark. Uh, I used uh, forward PEs of 22 and 13. I'm getting a buy, upside downside of about five to one, and a total return of about 16. But I'm looking at par. That's the one that's projected return on the SSG Plus. It's about 11%. I'm comparing that to the analysts' numbers, which are being captured and massaged by Manifest, and the analysts are at 11.2. I'm getting some really good validation for my uh, SSG. Uh, I'm in good company. I, I feel that I'm, I'm uh, looking at this company in the right way. Uh, so I'm fairly happy. Remember that the par at the end of last month was only 8%, so the par has moved up. That means the price has probably moved down a little bit, uh, and I feel this might be a great time to capture some shares of Coherent. So I think that's my last slide, Mark. Uh, one more. Nope, that's it. That's, that is my last slide. So I'm going to suggest we add Coherent, uh, the laser company, the leader in photonics. I'm suggesting we add that to our portfolio. Very cool. Thanks, Ken. Brings back fond memories. I know that probably 15 years ago, I brought that to the Securities Review Committee for Better Investing Magazine. So I think I might go back and take a look at that article. Do a little nostalgia. All right, uh, we're running at about 9.29. I'll try to wrap this up in five minutes or so so we can move on um, and get to the Q&A also, the poll and then the Q&A. I, I, like Ken, I also, also like to share, as Cy does every month also when he's here, where the ideas come from. This is what we dub our ivory soap screen at Manifest. It's basically searching for among the companies that we cover the ones that are in the top one half of 1% based on the return forecast, which is the PAR, the projected annual return, in combination and basically equally weighted with quality. In other words, we want better companies at better prices. Um, and we come up, hit the search results, entering that one, that one single number in as a minimum, that 99.44, you end up with this as a short list of companies to study. Uh, I like a bunch of these. I mean, I would I would study and consider almost all of them. A couple of them make me a little skittish. Those with higher PEs and high, and lower financial strengths might be uh, ones that I would skip over right now. Like Ken, I do like to find a good company with a decent outlook and a 
a decent growth rate and a relatively uh, modest PE, and there's a few of them on the list that actually capture my attention. Um, bought some United Natural Foods after the announcement of the super value acquisition that's taken a bit of a dive based on uh, the uncertainty there. One of Ken's favorites that's been extremely rewarding to people that have followed the roundtable, Simulations Plus. That's a good study and uh, worth digging into a little bit more. I'm drawn to Skechers because uh, I need a new pair of tennis shoes. Here's a quick look at Morningstar to see you know, what might be on sale over there. And I, I see a couple here that would grab my attention a little bit at least. Um, Tata Motors, TTM. That could be worth a little bit of a closer look. I left the quality on there. You can see that somebody in the green room was asking about McKesson. Um, I think that industry will be challenged, but it's not going to disappear anytime soon. Could be worth digging into that. Notice the Cardinal Health is also on this list, probably by, by virtue of that same price pressure. So there's some interesting companies here, along with uh, limited brands, L brands, ticker LB at the bottom. So... Um, Tata probably jumps the most off that list. And then also taking a look at Hugh McManus's favorite way to look for companies. We've dubbed it Irish Spring, much like the Ivory Soap Search, only this time we include, we want to find companies that are trading relatively close to their 52-week low. And there's a number of companies. A couple of these also came up in the green room. Um, Signature Bank is right there at the top of the list, trading very close to its 52-week low. And again, we recommended that if you want to study that in more depth, you probably should include the works of Eddie Elfenbein at CrossingWallStreet.com. Um, that would be a pretty good study also to see what's up there. I know that Carnival Corporation is the stock to study for September from Better Investing, so that might be worth a closer look. Uh, Hugh likes to shop for companies that are within 20% of that uh, 52-week low, and you can see that many of them fit this bill or in that proximity. And uh, Skechers shows up here again. So I'm, I'm going to go with Skechers. I need a new pair of tennis shoes. I've always liked Skechers. So let's talk Skechers. Not exactly up straight and parallel. They, uh, they can be a, a victim of recessions and um, darker economies. They actually did some restructuring back about seven years ago, and that resulted in the E disappearing from this chart. The, the sales fell off. They closed some stores. They did some things. But, again, coming out of that, they've actually done a pretty good job of uh, managing their business over the last five to seven years, and you can see that they have kind of restored up straight in parallel. Along with all those challenges and some of that in uncertainty, there has been a little bit of a price plateau for the last two to three years, so we note that. Uh, many of you out there probably own some of their products or have shopped them or worn them in the past. Uh, favorite among uh, medical professionals for running around in hospitals, I know. I've got two sisters that are nurses and very comfortable footwear for that. We've also got Susan and, and uh, Kim that are retired nurses here as guest damsels, so I know that uh, that's an important thing. And again, um, pretty well distributed as far as stuff that they cover. They claim to be number one when it comes to, and what were the definitions, uh, casual and casual athletic and walking shoes and running shoes. They've got uh, a product in all four of those categories in the number one position. But the thing that really leads me to them and kind of the discussion here tonight a bit is this: the reality that these guys, and sorry for the pun, Global Footprint, um, much like the company that Ken presented, these guys have a very strong international presence. Again, 60 to 70 percent of their revenues and their profits coming from non-U.S. Uh, business lines. So uh, they're fairly well entrenched worldwide and uh, compete pretty significantly in places like China and Singapore, Latin America, and Israel, as shown on the chart. So uh, they come up as a subject of conversation in uh, and all of the talk about the tariffs and uh, the uncertainty with respect to the tariffs has caused damage to some companies. I, I think these guys are among that pack. Um, my personal opinion is a lot of the stuff is a lot of bark and less bite. Uh, could be wrong about that, but I think that, uh, that we're basically negotiating to repair some conditions that have been 
less than optimum, and I'm sugarcoating, for 30 or 40 years in many cases. And uh, hopefully some progress will be made. Uh, the tariffs um, do introduce a bit of uncertainty. Here's a look at the sketchers over the last 10 years. You can see that they have had periods where, again, after the restructuring and the, the realignment, they they zoomed up pretty good in the midsection of this graphic. They probably got a little bit ahead of themselves and they have, for that reason ended up with this plateau on the, the right-hand side of the page. But again, it is fairly decent progress left to right on the chart with a pretty good uh, step down, again, probably tariff-related on the right-hand side of this chart. Here's what they look like looking at the actual assumptions. We're talking about a four to five billion dollar company growing at eight to nine percent with uh, fairly consistent margins. If you uh, look beyond that uh, restructuring period that we talked about, um, again, fairly decent seven, eight, nine percent, even potential type margins going forward. And uh, for a retailer, fairly steady PEs in that mid teens range. 15, 16, 17, those type of numbers will lead you to a upper teens return forecast. And you can see that the return forecast at value line has actually jumped up fairly noticeably. Again, most of that is because they've dropped from $38 a share down to $26 a share. So it, it really is a, a situation with, again, keeping the long term in perspective. The tariff thing is probably overdone, overblown. Uh, keep the long term perspective. And one of the things that I find absolutely amazing, I wrote an article a few years ago talking about how a lot of the retail companies that we fear and dread as investors have actually been among the, the best, the Aeropostales, the, the Abercrombie and companies, and those type of companies have actually been among the best, um, most rewarding companies to shareholders. Well, here's another one. These guys have actually returned 18.7% annualized to shareholders for the trailing 15 years. So again, if you can... Uh, Get them on the dip and perhaps not be married to them. You don't have to treat them like one of your own children. It can be an opportunity. This is probably one of those opportunities, and I'm going to add it to the tracking portfolio. So Skechers, ticker symbol SKX. So with that, Ken, I think we can go ahead and launch the poll. I think it's important to note that, boy, we sure have some uh, interesting stocks presented here tonight. Yeah, Mark, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Okay, here I am launching the poll. And folks, uh, if you're on a tablet or uh, a computer, uh, even if you're on a phone, uh, use your use your device or your finger and, and choose one of these for us here. Uh, I'm looking at the percentage voting and We'd like to close it down when we've had 85 or 90% of our audience voting. Uh, we're up to 75%. So if you're, if you're hesitating, uh, it doesn't cost you anything and nobody knows what you voted for. So uh, come out and give us, a, give us a vote. Mark's, gonna, Mark's going to try to audit the vote. I, I so. send Christmas cards. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to count to about 10 in my head here. Uh, we just hit the 85 percent, uh, 86 percent. So come on, give us a, a vote if you haven't uh, made a choice by this time. Oh, you know it's I'm a landslide. Going to, I'm going to close the poll. And I'm going to share the results. Okay. And... Uh, Looks like we're going to add another position in coherent here. Okay, uh, uh, cognizant 15%, coherent 60%, uh, Iona 6%, Skechers 18, and we have 1% of you that don't like any of them. So. Well, that's not bad. That's that's that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, well, coherent. So, um, coherent. I'm going to hide these results here, and Herb, I, I hope you're not stunned, Herb. Uh, no, I, actually, I'm pretty excited because I know that I have won a couple of the contests with some of my presentations. So mm -hmm. hang on, people. We're, here, we'll see what happens. <laughs> right. That's right. So Herb's Herb's uh, uh, aiming for the the grandstand. He's he's shooting for the uh, for the fence there on Ionis here. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, Mark and I and Cy uh, and Hugh are going to be in various places uh, throughout the next eight or ten months. 
if you're down around Oklahoma City, uh, come join us on August 18th. Or if you're near Atlanta, come join Mark and Cy on August 25th. Our August roundtable will again be the last Tuesday of the month, August 28th. Southeast Michigan is becoming active again, and we're um, I'm going to be down in southeastern Michigan along with Mark on October 6th. Uh, that's in Troy, Michigan. Uh, go to the website for more information. Mark will be in Washington in October. I'll be in Charlotte, North Carolina in late October. We'll both be in Pittsburgh in May. And at the National Convention, you should be able to meet all four of the Knights of the Roundtable. All four of us have been invited to the convention this year, and we're crossing our fingers that that not only can Cy make it, and he usually is able to, but we're hoping that Hugh is going to be able to make it as we, well. We could quite uh, here. Go on, Mark. I was just going to say, we could quite easily have a Justice League panel <laughs> in, in Chicago. So. No costumes, okay? We might have to put the costumes on, Ken. No, no costumes. <laughs> um, I will do just an additional plug for that joint meeting with the AAII and NEIC in Washington, D.C. in October. I've actually been digging into, if many of you will remember, the Level 3 Investing book by James Clunan. He's the founder of AAII. And uh, looking at that book in combination with George Nicholson's Investor Manual and just basically building a case that these two these two firms, which are dedicated and focused on education and collaboration uh, and the way that these two books kind of come together and cement some really successful long-term investing concepts. So it's turning out to be some really decent research, and I, I really look forward to sharing that perhaps there and beyond. Cy and I are actually going to be talking about risk and what it really is in uh, Atlanta in August also as part of a session. So. Fun stuff all around, and uh, I'll I'll tell you folks if you're if you're with a chapter and you're looking for a program in the spring, uh, Mark and I have a few dates open yet. So uh, if you want to give us a, a call or drop an email to us, we can uh, arrange something. If you're looking to put a program together. Uh, we will be trying to answer most of the questions that are on the website here. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to put an official end to this particular session of the roundtable. Uh, boy, we came in within two minutes of time tonight, Mark. That's pretty decent, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and uh, folks, don't leave after Mark does the sign-off. Uh, we will be answering your questions. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Usually we're able to close the list down. So thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, Herb, any final comments? Uh, just that you forgot the November 10th stock pickers breakfast in, in uh, yeah. Saginaw. I forgot, I forgot my own chapter's program. We'll, we'll get that on the list for next month. We'll put that on the list for next month here. Special, thank you so much, Herb. Special and Mark, thanks, Herb. Any, any last uh, uh, comments, Mark? Well, just thanks, everybody. It's, it's been a good run for eight years. Uh, um, the cash flow in the Robertson household is better than it used to be now that college is over and a few things. And I'm, I'm enjoying investing in this stuff. And it, it's, it's, it's good stuff. So, uh, again, thanks to everybody for showing up. A special thanks to you, Herb, for uh, filling in tonight. Sure. Look forward to seeing you soon, sir. Anytime. All right. Good night, everybody. So.